developers want to see those rarities in our county because uh, then we can boast about it and go, we have a rare bird here. So Liam is definitely on the hunt for that and uh, we're excited to have him tonight. And so welcome um, tonight. I'm going to go over a few things about the Zoom program. What we do is uh, ask everybody to kind of mute themselves, which is hard because, you know, we all want to interact. But the way you can interact and ask questions or make comments is through the chat icon down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please go ahead while Liam's talking, put your questions, put your comments. You can even put some sightings. I know we kind of uh, enjoyed that as when we had programs when we met. But right now, we're going to just put those in chat sightings. And so what happens is throughout the night when Liam's talking and there's a little break, I will uh, ask everybody to um, you know, stop the program. And we will then bring open the chat questions and comments and kind of go through them for a little intermission, little break. And um, let's see. Also, I have to remind everybody, or most of you maybe have, don't need to be reminded, March is our renewal, when you renew your membership with our local chapter here. Very important to become a member of your local Audubon chapter, um, Alpecal Audubon. So hopefully most of you got a renewal letter, and if you didn't, please join our local Audubon chapter. Um, if you are a national Audubon member, you actually aren't a member of the local Alpecal Audubon. We do have a partnership with National Audubon, but for you to feel good about everything, join your local chapter and join National Audubon. You're supporting two great bird advocacy groups and, um, and you're doing a positive thing for the world. Um, next, our news, our next newsletter is full of field trips. Uh, we are taking the guidelines of National Audubon that limits them to six per field trip. And you'll read about um, the guidelines about, you know, everybody brings their own car, don't share your optics. Um, and Let's see. More than six have sort of showed up, so we're hoping that we can get extra field trip leaders to take the overflow. Um, and that will be up to the field trip leader to make those arrangements. But um, I don't think I have much else. Uh, Mary, do you have anything about the Zoom and how it's going to work tonight? You're on mute. <laughs> I think we can just um, interject on Liam when we hear him pause for a second or two and say, hey, we found some questions in the chat. OK. So anyway, uh, welcome again tonight. Uh, we're going to go ahead with uh, Liam Huber's Rare Bird Alert, Butte County. And he's going to talk about all the birds that live here and possibly some rare birds that he provided over the last year. So welcome, Liam Huber. Hi. Um, OK, let me uh, put up my presentation here. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, OK, so let's see. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of, um, I'm going to start out with some of the, uh, some of the more rare birds that uh, I found and that I've seen or got photos of that other people have found um, over the last year or so. And then uh, I'll, I'll move into some uh, birds that are not as rare, but uh, are likely not seen by, still not seen by very many people. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, so uh, here's the first bird is a uh, long-eared owl. 
Um, this, uh, let's see, this was in Lower Paradise on some private property. Uh, I got a, an email from someone uh, telling me that this, this bird had showed up and was, uh, when we got there, um, I headed up with two or three people trying to get some photos of it. And um, it was, we, it was in a very um, congested patch of bushes and small trees. And we, we didn't want to disturb it too much. So we didn't really um, traipse through the area more than, more than I thought we should. But uh, eventually we were able to uh, flush the bird out and he came up and he posed for 10 minutes, about 10 feet up in a pine tree. Um, this is, like this says, it's the, this is only the fifth record in Butte County in the last 35 years. Um, I assume that there are more long-eared owls than that, but they're very secretive and um, they breed really high up in the mountains. So, it makes sense that not very many people have seen them. Um, and we also had another long-eared owl that a few of us saw over near um, in the channel behind the tree farm a few months ago. Uh, okay, so this is a, this is a female bobolink. Um, I found this at the uh, university farm. Um, I think, about the first the end of the first week of September. Uh, this is only the second county record. The first county record was about 12 years ago at the same location. Uh, and there actually was three uh, bobolinks last year when I found this one. Um, I was just driving down the road and I thought I saw a female yellow-headed blackbird. And I took a photo of it and I kept driving and then about a minute later, I thought, that's kind of weird. <laughs> I should probably go back and make sure that's what it was. And yeah, the bird was still sitting there and it was this female bobolink. Um, you notice in this photo, uh, we were able to get very close, but oftentimes one of the few things you can see from a distance is these really sharp um, tail feathers. Uh, which I don't know of any, it's almost woodpecker-like is how their tail feathers are. I don't know what the purpose of that is, but it's a good field mark. Um, let's see. Oh, so this was, uh, this was found by uh, Mary Muchowski and Lisa Winslow uh, out near Richvale uh, in a flooded field in the fall. This is a Pacific Golden Plover, uh, only the third county record, and as it says, first record since 2003, and both the records before were in 2003. Um, the, I wish I remembered what made this a Pacific Golden Plover over an American, um, but the gold tells you that it's not a black-bellied plover. Um, so, and that's, well, third county record, so that's exceptionally rare. Um, I think there's only about 10 records in the North Central Valley. Uh, okay. Oh, here's, um, you can see seven, there's 17 uh, overall records in Butte County of redneck grieve, and six of them have come since last October. Um, let's see, the, this bird on the left that's showing the really bright red was at Lake Oroville uh, near the dam. I was there one day. I had not been there a single time last year. I kind of forgot that Lake Oroville existed. And uh, I, went, I went with my scope to the dam and I was looking for about an hour, could hardly find anything. And suddenly these two birds uh, came up pretty far away, probably about a mile away. And um, I could just barely make out the, the reddish brownish color on the neck. And so uh, I told a couple people and they, uh, JT Lewis uh, went to the opposite side of the dam and was able to um, get temporary access to go see if he could see them closer. He ended up finding them. There were 
There was a pair, uh, this bird is a juvenile. You can tell by the black stripes in the, in the white patch of the cheek. Um, and it was with uh, an adult. And so these birds were there for uh, about a week before Michael Rajner found a third, uh, a second juvenile with these two. And these birds, the first two left after about a month and the third one stayed for about three months. So that was pretty cool. And then this one on the right, top right with the fish is another juvenile. And this was found by Matt Forster in October at the, at the causeway at the after bay, um, which is where they have primarily been found in the past. Okay, so this Brewer Sparrow is potentially not that rare, but a lot of people don't, uh, a lot of people have a hard time identifying them. Uh, this bird on the left, I took about two weeks for people to finally decide what it was. Uh, we were trying to decide between a Brewer Sparrow and a clay colored sparrow, um, but eventually, uh, a couple experts ended up deciding on it being a brewer's. And then this, uh, so that was at the Richvale Sewer Ponds in August, last August. And this bird on the right was part of a pair, uh, an adult and an immature that were, or were, they were near, they were on the diversion channel near the top of 20th Street. Um, and they stayed for about a month Within an air, within about a 50 foot section of trail, uh, eating these seeds on uh, whatever this plant is, uh, and could be seen from about 20 feet away. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's not a great photo, but it was uh, about to be dark. Uh, but this is one of the northern shrikes that. Uh, we're assuming is the same bird that was on Cottonwood Road last winter. And uh, we spent, uh, myself and a couple other people, probably checked Cottonwood Road 50 times through this winter, hoping to refine one uh, and had no luck. So we kind of gave up. And then again, Mary and Lisa found this bird about a month ago. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still there, but it could be. It's been hanging out right near the, the bridge over the creek just east of the electrical station. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is one of the most difficult birds, I would say, to ID in this county. Uh, Semi-palmated sandpiper, very similar to western sandpiper. Uh, the main difference, uh, this photo on the right is of a, the bird on the right in that photo is the semi-palmated sandpiper. The bird on the left is a western. Um, this photo on the left, you can see the, the feathers on the back and the wings have this sort of a scalloped, scaly appearance. And it's got um, a very uh, pale white supercilium, so that line above the eye. Uh, it's the bill, people, some people describe it as tubular shaped, but it's, um, it's about right in between the length of a least sandpiper's bill and a western. And both western and least have a slightly decurved bill, so it curves down, whereas semi-palmated sandpiper has a straight bill. Uh, and then they also often have this sort of uh, buffy, um, collar that you can see here. Uh, so there are only 19 total records in Butte County. Um, I, I happened to find 11 different semi-palmated sandpipers last year in fall. Um, it's all about, you know, knowing where to look and going and looking at the right time. Um, uh, let's see, uh, twice I had them uh, in rice fields near Richvale, uh, and a couple more times were at uh, the Chihuahua Sedation Ponds. And then at the end of migration, I actually had a group of six at Gray Lodge. Uh, so this is another returning bird. 
This is a female red nape sapsucker. You can tell uh, this picture on the right is good. For, uh, you can see that the throat is split halfway red and white. The male would have a full red throat. Uh, you can tell it's a red naped. Otherwise, uh, it's lacking all the red in the head that a red breasted would have. And it's got this nice little red patch um, at the back of the nape. And then the red on the crown is separated. Uh, you're likely, you likely have a hybrid or something else if the, the red in the nape and the crown connect. So this is clean, so it's um, clearly a pure red nape sapsucker. Um, these tend to show up, usually one shows up every winter. Uh, okay, so this is the Pacific loon. Um, not sure if it's an adult or an immature. They look the same in winter. Um, but these, the, so this was actually a pair. Uh, this photo in the top left uh, was this. So at first, um, this was at the Thermalito after bay north of the causeway. This bird hung out for right about three months between uh, I think October 20th, maybe it's more than three months, uh, October 20th and January 15th. Um, and after about two weeks, it was joined by another one. Um, th this photo on the top left is of it interacting with a pair of common loons, uh, which it was hanging out with for most of the two weeks before the other bird arrived. Uh, this much closer photo was, um, I took a kayak out a couple of weeks after the second bird got here and I wanted to see if I could get any closer views, closer photos. And I, I kayaked out straight to the middle of the, of the north section of the after bay and couldn't find anything for quite a while. And all of a sudden I heard, I heard these crazy noises and I turned around and about a hundred feet away uh, were a pair of common loons with this loon. And uh, the common loons got pretty freaked out and they flew all the way across the North After Bay. And this bird just started to swim towards my kayak. And uh, so I kept pretty still and eventually it got to within about 10 feet of my kayak. And, and uh, I took a bunch of pictures and then I just sat and watched and it, uh, it actually started diving back and forth beneath my kayak. So that was pretty awesome. And we probably, uh, I probably went and looked at these birds about 40 times while they were here. Um, and this is the, this was the first record in Butte County of two together. Uh, marbled Godwit is another bird that probably comes through pretty often in migration, um, but they can be hard to ID from a distance uh, and you just have to be out a lot. Uh, I was able to find, I believe, eight different individuals last fall. Um, most of them were near Richvale in some, in, a, in some of the only flooded rice fields last fall. Uh, they like to hang out with groups of peeps, so small sandpipers, and um, often with dowagers, which they're much larger than. Uh, you can see here is a photo of uh, Godwit compared with a curlew. So it's maybe about um, a third smaller. And uh, you can tell them pretty easily by this giant, uh, slightly up curved bill that is bicolored. So it's pink at the base, black at the tip. Um, let's see. Oh, so, okay. So summer tanager, they come through occasionally in fall migration. Um, usually September or October, no, mo pretty much only September. And uh, so this is a male, uh, full bright red. And I was surprised to figure out that this was only the seventh county record. Um, there have been about four in the last five years that have showed up, all males. Um, and this, this, so this bird was at the, at the, tree farm, the 
Mendocino National For the Genetic Resource Center, um, right at, right near the entrance inside the gate. Uh, I was there taking photos of cedar wax wings, and all of a sudden I noticed this bright flash of red. And I actually I was visiting the tree farm every day in hopes of finding a summer tanager. So it it worked out pretty well. Um, and uh, female would be yellow. Trumpeter swan, uh, another bird that I'm sure there are a lot more of than people find just because of how many swans there are in this area in winter. Um, so this is a nice comparison, this photo on the left. You can, uh, I mean, it's hard to tell necessarily if this bird is bigger, but they're much larger than a tundra swan. And you can see this, the difference in the, um, it's called the laurel skin is this connection between the bill and the eye. And you can see it is a very kind of uh, thin connection with the eye of the tundra swan behind it, the one with the yellow patch on the lore. Uh, this, so this trumpeter swan, that connection is so wide that it engulfs the entire eye. So it's a good field mark. And then it's also got this straight edged top to the bill and in a tundra swan that would be curved. Um, and then this other, this, this bird on the right, it's the, bird, it's the swan on the bottom. Uh, I actually was just taking photos of swans and looked through the photos later and discovered that I had a trumpeter swan in my photo. Uh, you can kind of tell from this photo, the wings are much wider and the bird is just overall larger and it's missing that yellow lore patch uh, and it's got that heavier connection to the eye. Um, okay, uh, so this is a female white winged scoter. Uh, this was on again on the north section of the after bay in October. Uh, she was there for about five days uh, and mostly hung out alone. Uh, at one point, I think I think this bird was with a, a group of coots, but mostly alone. Um, it's a really large duck. I, I probably most comparable to a mallard, but I think slightly larger. Um, winter, the, any time they show up should be between about October and January. Uh, and I think besides a record from last year, there have only been a couple of records in the last 10 years or so. So uh, Liam, can we take a break here and look at yes. some of the chat uh, yes. questions? Um, do you have your chat questions up or? Uh, um, not quite sure how to see those. Um, if, well, if you hit uh, chat. Oh, oh, okay, I can see it now. Okay. Uh, I can read them if you can't see them. Um, but otherwise, you just press the chat thing on the bottom and it should pop. I think I may not be able to look at it while I'm sharing my screen. Oh, okay. All right. So, um, Mary, you can go ahead if you want to. There's oh, okay, okay, I've got it. I've got it now. I got, I just got it up. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, I've answered some of them, but Jennifer asks, "Has um, Butte County ever reported a mountain plover?" Oh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, there have, as far as I know. I think there's been one record about 50 years ago uh, on the west side of the county. I'm surprised that there have not been more as uh, they're often in some of the counties just west and just south of us. Um, but if they were to show up, they'd most likely be in those freshly plowed or um, uh, rice fields just after they've been emptied. Uh, let's see, 10 records. Okay, so uh, 10 records for Pacific loons. So the birds that, the pair that was here for four months were probably seen 50 times, but I, I would only count that as one record because it's the same two birds in the same place for that given period of time. So uh, 10 Pacific loons would be 
yeah um let's see uh okay that looks like all the questions for right, right. now okay. so that's that's great um we can move forward and see what else what rare and unusual all right um uh, okay uh so this is a ver female vermilion flycatcher and it's a young female you can tell by the uh the color in the kind of under tail vent area is yellow and in an adult female it would be red similar to like a faded version of what a male's color is um so this would be a first year female vermilion flycatcher this was at the chico oxidation ponds um i was doing bi-weekly surveys there for quite a few months and uh i had been preparing myself for the week between about October 15th and October 22nd is typically when vermilion flycatchers pass through this part of California. Um, so I guess I was ready for this bird to show up. I think this is about October, maybe a little early, maybe about the 10th. Um, we were able to get a few people out on a couple field trips to see this female and actually on one of the field trips uh, a male showed up and joined this female during our field trip so that was pretty awesome. Um, uh, Red-breasted merganser, uh, these likely show up more often than they are reported uh, especially on Lake Oroville. Uh, neither of these birds, both of these um, female in the bottom right uh, was at the Thermalito after bay south of the causeway, only about 20 feet offshore. Uh, I, I was driving down the causeway and this merganser flew in front of my car and I went, oh, that looks maybe like a red-breasted merganser. So I stopped and there it was. And then this male uh, was actually found by Mary and Lisa again. Uh, with a pair of females at the Four Bay near the Four Bay Bridge on Nelson Avenue. Yeah, on Nelson Avenue. Um, and these birds hung out, that group hung out for about three weeks. Uh, this male, when I took this photo, was maybe 20 yards offshore. Uh, myself and Mike Scram had a group of nine red breasted mergansers at Lake Oroville in November, I think. Um, so they definitely pass through in numbers. You just kind of have to be lucky and catch them. Uh, this male, you can tell uh, mostly because a male common merganser would be mostly white in the body. This bird's got a lot of gray and black. And it's the both birds have very um, shaggy crests and the dark, kind of uh, breast patch on this male makes it look like it's got a big white necklace, which is something Mary pointed out to me. Um, okay, so uh, this bird took a very long time to figure out and I realized that a lot of people don't care at all about gulls, uh, but I would very much like you to care about gulls. So um, uh, this is the first county record of a lesser blackback gull. This was on January 1st of this year at Gray Lodge. Um, it's a pretty rare gull in California in general. Uh, this is a hard photo to tell from, but it's closest in appearance to probably a Western gull, which uh, both of them have a really, so this color on the back and the, and the top side of the wings is the mantle. Uh, the, color, the gray color in, these two, in those two species is very dark compared to all the other gulls we have here. So we actually thought this was a Western gull at first until we learned that the, you can kind of just make out some streaking on the neck and in the face. Um, Western, Western gulls almost never have any markings on the face. It's, they almost always have a bright white, pure white head. So that kind of keyed me into the difference in this bird. And then uh, I found another photo I had that showed it with a herring gull which should be larger than a lesser black-backed gull and is a and was larger. 
So those things kind of keyed me in and I sent it to a couple gull experts in Southern California and they confirmed it. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, that's the first county record. And then here's another first county record. Uh, this was just about a month ago at the after bay, uh, right off the causeway. This is an adult Western gull. You can see uh, what I was talking about. It's got a totally white head. Uh, it's got a really large yellow bill with a, you can just make out kind of a pale tip to the bill and then a pretty dark mantle. Uh, this is a really large gull, uh, about as big as we would have any gulls around here. Um, let's see, and this bird was around for a few days, but I have not seen it since. Uh, so now I'm gonna go into um, hybrids because hybrids are rare too. And again, I, a lot of people don't care about hybrids, but I think you should care about hybrids. So um, this is a, an Olympic gull uh, called that because their main concentration in the United States is around, uh, is in Washington. And uh, we thought this was a Western gull for quite a while. A bunch of people came and saw it um, until we were informed that the, this, so compared to the last bird, this bill is even larger and very pale yellow. Uh, and then it's got, um, it's got a bit of a, almost what looks like a ring on the bill. Uh, that's another, what some people might call an impurity on a hybrid. And then the, uh, probably the best um, field mark to pick it out as this hybrid is this kind of dirty look to the head. It's got a lot of this light brown modeling throughout the head and neck. And that is a, um, that's a very common feature of a glaucous wing gull. So that's kind of the, you can see the um, features from the glaucous wing and the Western combining to make this bird. Um, oh, so this, this is a, uh, this was, I got out of my car at Yonoseko and just five feet away from my car, this bird was sleeping on the shore and you could immediately tell the green on the head. Uh, so the bird on the top right is just a regular male northern pintail. Uh, and the bird on the, the other two photos is this male mallard northern pintail hybrid. Um, you can obviously see the general appearance resembles a pintail a lot, but the, it's got the green in the head of a mallard. And then you can also see it's got the kind of chest, warm chestnut color on the breast. Of a, of a male mallard. Uh, this bird stuck around there for about a month and I never saw it further than about 20 feet away from the platform. Uh, these are not great photos, but it can kind of show. Uh, this top left bird is a male common golden eye barrels, golden eye hybrid. Um, you can't tell from this photo, but it's the, the big white patch in the face is so sort of um, an oval, so kind of in between the crescent and circle of uh, the two males of their, of their respective species. And then it's got this little, uh, coming down on the shoulder, it's got a little black spur, which is uh, diagnostic for a male Barrow's golden eye, but it only had a black spur on one side. Uh, so that's kind of weird. And uh, it's got a lot of black here in kind of, uh, in the wings, which a male common golden knight hardly has any black and a barrows has much more. So that's kind of an intermediate look. Uh, then this bird on the bottom, which I just saw again today at Yonoseko, um, this same individual is a male Eurasian American Wigeon hybrid. Uh, you can see the pale kind of creamy colored forehead uh, and the sort of dark shadow around the eye that would typically lead into a into green on a male American widgeon, but it's got that rusty orange of the Eurasian, and it's got some of the gray, the very light gray back uh, feathers of a male Eurasian widgeon, whereas a male American would have sort of a red, a rusty brown color. Um, I think this is the last hybrid. This is a uh, male red, well, 
Yeah, a male red nape red breasted sapsucker hybrid. This was just a couple weeks ago at the uh, Gridley sewer ponds, um, which are out east of Gridley. Uh, so things to look at are, you can kind of tell at the base of this red patch at the throat that there's a black, kind of a black border starting, but the red is bleeding over the black, which in a red naped, it would be contained by the black. And in a red breasted sapsucker, there would be no black. Uh, and then in the crown, Normally, we talked about that uh, red nape spot on a red nape, but in this bird, that red is just connecting from the crown all the way back into the nape. So they're both signs of hybridization there. Um, and then this is not a hybrid, but I thought this was very interesting. Um, this was uh, Steve McDonald, who's a local photographer, taught me about this. It's pretty rare. Um, this is a tiger pintail. It's actually a female, and um, it is a it's a pretty old female that has lost most of its estrogen hormones, which results in it sort of reverting back to, I guess, what you would call its default male plumage, which is really uh, interesting and kind of bizarre. Um, this is the only one I have ever seen ever anywhere. Uh, Steve McDonald told me he's seen a couple of these at Yonoseko. This was at Yonoseko. So that's a really cool bird to look out for. Um, let's see. Uh, so I'm just going to check if there's any more. Okay. So these, uh, from here on, it's going to be birds that are not necessarily rare, but either people don't get the chance to see them very often or they're just not easy to see. Um, or maybe they're only viewable at a couple of places. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, these are both co color morphs of ferruginous hawk. Uh, overall, I would say ferruginous hawk is not that uncommon in the winter. But uh, the dark morph on the right is pretty rare, especially in this area. Um, this, this adult dark morph was on Wilbur Road, south of Highway 162, uh, just almost to Nelson Avenue about two weeks ago. Uh, and then this light morph adult was over off of Highway 32, sort of near the river. Um, uh, so these are males of two of our, you know, kind of specialty ducks that are not necessarily rare, but don't get found very often. Um, male, this male Barrow's golden eye, you can see the really well, this black spur that I was talking about coming off the shoulder and these white, it's, um, I heard someone call it the trail of tears uh, down the back, these white patches through its sort of black backpack, sort of a patch of black. And uh, you can see those white spots when it, they're in flight also, if you're close enough. Um, and then it's got this nice crescent shaped white patch at the base of the bill. And then this uh, male Eurasian widgeon. Normally, uh, there are very few places that they are regularly seen, um, Gray Lodge and Yonoseiko being the main ones. Uh, but you still don't typically see them as close as this bird was. Uh, this male was calling, which is actually how we found it. They just have a really loud, uh, pretty long, hollow whistle call. Um, I would recommend looking it up. It's a really easy way to find out that there's one at whatever spot you're at. Um, without having to scope for two hours. Uh, this bird was only about 50 feet from the platform. And it's got, you can see this uh, little green patch around the eye is a pretty rare uh, color variation in a male Eurasian widgeon. I originally thought it could be a hybrid because of that, but apparently it's just a natural um, possibility. Uh, Mountain Bluebird. 
Um, they're very, they're a very eruptive species in our area. So some years there are big numbers and they're in multiple places. Other years, like last year, uh, they don't show up at all. Uh, I probably spent 20 different days all day looking for these last year and I could not find any. Uh, this group was a group of about 15 on Wilbur Road south of Highway 162 um, that Matt Forster and Ross Schaefer found about a month ago. Um, let's see. And there, it was actually, the group was mostly males, which is pretty, um, which is not very typical. You usually see primarily females in groups that large. Uh, Pacific Wren, um, this is a bird that can be very difficult to find, uh, especially during this time of year when they're not singing. Uh, actually, they, they will start singing right about now, but for about the past four months, they've not been singing. So they're most easily located by their um, three-part call note or their three call note series. Um, and uh, so they're very similar to a house wren. Uh, this bird was, it's likely still hanging out at uh, Paradise Lake. There's a little patch of blackberry bushes um, about a mile down the trail from the parking area where this bird is hanging out. And um, it's very similar to a house wren, but smaller and uh, kind of more compact in a more uh, richer, darker brown. Um, and these are, these get decently easy to find in the mountains above, above about 2,000 feet starting in April. Hey, Lee, uh, Jennifer, yes. Jennifer asked if you've seen more ferruginous hawks this year. Uh, I would actually say that I've seen less ferruginous hawks this year than in past years. Um, typically in the past, I would have expected to see multiple on a drive of Meridian Road and also Lassen Road. No, not Lassen, um, Cottonwood Road. Uh, I've only seen one ferruginous hawk in this entire winter on Cottonwood Road. And there's only been one and sometimes two on Meridian, but a lot of days there's none. Um, I would say in general, there's been a bit less, but not, uh, not in, to an alarming extent. Um, okay, uh, so blue winged teal, I'm sure most people that have been to Gray Lodge in the winter have probably seen blue winged teal near the uh, parking lot 14, the start of the auto loop. That's their favorite place to hang out. Um, I'd say about 95% of the time they're seen in Butte County, they are in one of the two ponds there, right near uh, parking lot 14 at Gray Lodge. Um, this male uh, was part of a group of, I think, 10 that were all swimming in single file uh, and just happened to be very close to the, um, to the road. Uh, occasionally, you, you'll see them starting in March and April as they start to leave. You'll see them in um, small ponds kind of throughout the county. Uh, I just had a group of them. There's a wetland on uh, Oro Chico Highway uh, that's got a ton of water right now and it's got blue wing and cinnamon teal right now. Um, okay, more gull. Uh, so these are three, these are probably our three um, most uncommon gulls uh, that show up some relatively regularly. Um, Mew gull in the top right, definitely the easiest to pick out. Uh, they're smaller than any of our regularly occurring winter gulls. And the easiest uh, field mark is their plain yellow bill, just completely yellow. Occasionally uh, in winter, adults will have a slight kind of a faint ring at the end of the bill, but you're very secure in your ID if you've got one with an all yellow bill. Uh, this was taken at, all these photos are taken at the Feather River Parkway um, from about the end of October through the beginning of March. 
Uh, it's a really good spot for gulls. Um, at times, anywhere from three to 600 gulls are there feeding on, on salmon. Um, and at mew gulls can be pretty, pretty rare certain years. Uh, there was a day this year when we had eight different mew gulls at the parkway. Um, and other good spots for them are uh, the diversion pool up above uh, the parkway. They like to sit on the buoys that cross the uh, uh, that cross the diversion pool. And then uh, I had quite a few last month on buoys around the dam at Lake Oroville. And occasionally they'll show up at the uh, causeway at the after bay also. Uh, on the left, um, this is a first winter glaucous wing gull. Um, it can be a daunting bird to call, but it's pretty easy. The, you can see here the primaries, so that the wing tips are the feathers are the same color as the body and the wings. There's pretty much no change in, in the uh, darkness of the brown. And it's got a big, thick black bill. And so if you look at, the, at this young uh, Iceland gull below it, you can see how much darker the primaries are than they are in the glaucous wing. Um, so that's just anything like, um, like a herring gull will also have those dark primaries. Glaucous wing is the only bird that will, the only gull that will have these light primaries, same color as the body. Uh, and they're a large gull, maybe sometimes even larger than a herring. And uh, so Iceland gull is what used to be Thayer's gull. Um, they're about, they're between the size of a California and a herring. Uh, they've got a much, you can see here, they've got a similar head structure and bill structure to the mew gull. So pretty uh, small rounded head, kind of a small bill. Um, normally they're much more intricately patterned the first winter Thayer's gulls than this bird, um, but the head and the bill and the size kind of speak for themselves usually. Uh, and then they've got these little white, on the ends of their primaries, they've got these little white edges, which oftentimes are much more pronounced than in this one. Um, but this was near the end of this winter, so it's starting to change plumage. Um, uh, White-throated sparrow, uh, they show up fairly often, you know, usually a few a year, but if you're actually trying to look for them, it's usually pretty difficult. It's kind of, it's usually just by chance that you see one. This is an adult um, white-striped white-throated sparrow. Uh, the other color variation that we get is a tan-striped, so much more drab. Uh, the white is very faded, kind of like a tannish color. The yellow lore is much fit more faded. Uh, this bird was actually in my backyard. Um, I just, I looked out the window uh, right before I was about to head out for the day and it was hanging out on our bird bath. So I was able to get some nice photos. Um, they are normally start showing up in late October and can be seen anywhere till about the end of April. Uh, short-eared owl. I, there are, I'm sure there are many more short-eared owls than people see, mostly because people don't go looking for owls all that often. Um, usually, you don't, you won't see them in the day in this area. Uh, occasionally, you can find them around the after bay, mostly at um, the end of South Wilbur Road. Uh, you can occasionally find them in the middle of the day. Um, this bird was at the Richvale Sewer Ponds. There's a bunch of uh, kind of empty fields behind the ponds, and uh, we were driving. We were driving behind the ponds, and we drove right past this bird, and then it flew up to even closer to our cars, just about 20 feet away, and just sort of watched us for a while. Um, definitely, by far the closest one I've seen. Um, a good spot to look for short-eared owls in January through about two-thirds of the way through February is, um, what's the road called? Wickman Road. It connects um, Highway 162 with the Richvale Highway. Uh, Mike Fisher and I saw three of them there one evening about 
uh, a couple months ago. Um, Golden Crown Kinglets. Uh, these show up a fair amount in the valley in winter. Um, definitely, I wouldn't say they're common, but they're pretty regular and they can be just about anywhere in the valley in winter. Um, typically, you don't see them this close. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people cannot hear their calls because they're so high pitched. So many people off will be in an, can be in an area and don't realize they're around. Um, I guess I'm just lucky to be young and have the ability to hear them most times. Uh, so they're, they're quite abundant uh, in the mountains during the spring and summer and fall. Um, flocks can be as big as anywhere from eight to 60. Uh, I think probably the best place to find them and get nice looks in the mountains is anywhere between uh, kind of the top of Butte Meadows and anywhere above Jonesville. Um, this, uh, this top right photo is actually taken at Gray Lodge a couple months ago. Um, and you can just barely make out, so they have this, they've got a big kind of yellow stripe in their crown. And then what they can sometimes flare, they've got a bright reddish orange thin line in the center of that yellow. And when they flare their crown, you get this big yellow flare with a red and orange in the middle. So it's like a big flaming patch. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so these are the uh, three types of um, three subspecies of Merlin you might see around here. Uh, Merlins are a little, sort of uncommon around here in winter, but not too uncommon. The, the main bird that we'll see in our area is the uh, taiga race, which is this one in the middle. It's kind of an intermediate in color. Um, and then you've got this female on the left is a prairie Merlin, which is much lighter, uh, a little bit hard to tell from this photo. It's a much lighter brown, kind of a light sandy tan color. And it's got very, um, a lot less streaking in the belly and the breast. Uh, and then this bird on the right is, um, so both the prairie and the black Merlin are pretty rare in our area. Uh, black Merlins are maybe a little bit more common. Um, you can see they've got much darker streaking and heavier streaking, uh, almost kind of forming some polka dot kind of look in the flanks um, and the very dark head. And if you were to see the underwings, the underwings are almost solid black. Um, so I think I probably saw three of these this winter compared to you know, probably see 10 per taiga merlins for every one of these other two. Um, chestnut back chickadee. Um, there's only a small portion of this county where these can really be found. And it's up in the uh, Forbes Town, Sly Creek Reservoir, sort of an air, sort of area, Feather Falls. Um, they like a very specific um, group of trees. Uh, two of the main trees that they really like are Tan Oaks and Madrone. Um, it's often hard to see them very close, but pretty much any chickadee you hear in that part of the county is likely to be chestnut backed. Occasionally you'll find mountain chickadees, but they're pretty rare up there. Um, chestnut backs like anywhere between about 2000 and 4,500 feet. Uh, you can tell pretty easily it's got this very um, um, kind of rusty, Rufus sides and back. Um, and they typically are in groups of about five to 20. Uh, pectoral sandpiper, it's somewhat rare actually. Um, I, I spent about, I spent every day for about two months last fall looking for this bird specifically. Um, I was able to find two one at the Gridley Sewer Ponds, and this one is at um, south of Yano Seco. There is a, uh, 
a Czech station and a small pond called Ed's Pool, uh, just across from the end of Nelson Road. And uh, normally they don't lower the water level in this pond, but it got pretty low at the end of fall in the, the beginning of October. Uh, and I just kept going back and checking. There was always just a group of yellow legs. And then this one morning, this bird was just sitting here about 30 feet from where I had parked. Uh, so you can tell it is larger than other small sandpipers. Uh, you can kind of tell that here compared to the killdeer. It's a maybe 80% the size of a killdeer. It's got, hard to tell, but these the crown has these kind of rufous, rusty stripes. And it's got a very streaked breast that ends abruptly and just becomes a just a full white belly. Uh, and it's got a pretty long bill for a sandpiper that's slightly down curved. Um, let's see. So common poor will. Um, these aren't all that rare, but you got to know where to look. And you, of course, have to be out at night. Um, the, so a really, really good spot that I just discovered last year for these was um, just below Humboldt Summit, there's a big hillside of, that's almost exclusively manzanita. Um, it goes for maybe it's about a mile long. It's, this is at about uh, 5,500 feet. And in September, the poor wills collect there in big numbers and call in the evening. So we actually had uh, Mary and I and uh, JT one evening were up there and had a bunch of them, you know, kind of coming in and mobbing us at our cars and it was pretty cool. This bird um, was the one I found when I discovered that they were there. Uh, I was parked and I was listening and I started hearing this weird clucking call, kind of like a chicken. And I was wondering if I had maybe found a uh, kind of, I had maybe distressed a mountain quail or something and it didn't, it was, um, freaking out because it was dark. And then I looked off on the road about five feet away, or 10, maybe 10 feet away, and this poor will was just sitting there clucking at me. So uh, that was a pretty cool experience. Uh, I think I probably have some questions, so I'm going to check on those. Um, let's see. Um, oh, I'm seeing stuff about uh, Golden Crown Kinglets and hearing aids. Uh, I know a, a number of people uh, I know have been able to hear them much better with hearing aids. Um, uh, did anyone follow up on Carolyn's poor, poor will that was there for a few years? Uh, I meant to go check that out, but I didn't feel comfortable this year uh, going in invading Carolyn's space, so I did not um, check that out. But oftentimes, poor wills will keep coming back to the same area many years in a row. So it's pretty likely if the bird is still around that it's still in that area. Uh, Bonaparte skull. So this is a, a non-breeding Bonaparte skull, um, which would be in uh, fall. Um, we don't get very many of these in Butte County, but they are pretty regular. They are pretty regular at the after bay in August and September, maybe even late July through September, and even into October. Um, um, Breeding plumage, they would have a full black hood, so their entire head would be black. Uh, that's much less, com those show up that time of year less commonly. Uh, oftentimes you'll see them at that time of year uh, out in rice fields that are flooded. Uh, probably the best spot to consistently find these is uh, they, often, they often fly along the uh, levees at the after bay. So if you just walk the levee at the after bay at the right time of year, they'll often you'll often see them cruising by. Um, this is our smallest gull, even smaller than a mule gull. Uh, another place that these can be at the right time of year is Lake Oroville. 
Uh, I just have a few more, and these are the kind of high elevation species that a lot of people, uh, I'm gonna check if I've got any more questions. Um, okay. Uh, nope. Oh, okay. So uh, our first, uh, so these are birds that are in the mountains, but very few, um, there's been very little birding done in the high mountains of Butte County. Uh, I went up there about, I spent about five days a week all day for the entire summer uh, exploring these parts of the mountains in Butte County. Uh, Canada Jay, um, it used to be that pretty much the only place people knew them to be was Cold Springs. Um, and still they were very seldom seen there. Uh, I found a spot this year called Scott, uh, it's called Scott's John Creek and it's got a three mile road that goes, that it borders it. Um, and uh, I found pretty consistently anywhere from two to six Canada Jays on this road. Um, sometimes I think one, the most adults I had was probably four uh, adults on the left here, uh, all very light pale color with a kind of black cap. And then this bird on the right is a juvenile. Um, Oftentimes, juveniles can be much more vocal. Uh, they make all kinds of crazy noises like jays tend to do. Um, a lot of, uh, they do sort of a red-tailed hawk imitation call, which is sort of the signature for a lot of jays. Um, I would, anywhere you can find recordings of them, they've got so many different calls. It's good to uh, familiarize yourself with them because it'll stand out immediately. Um, I'd say anywhere above about 5,000 feet is where these can be found. Um, a spot I'm hoping a lot more people get to this year is uh, called Summit Lake. Um, it's a lake I found. It's above, it's about 700 feet higher than the Butte Creek House Meadow uh, Preserve. You, so you drive past the, that, you drive past the preserve uh, maybe like a mile, and there's a road that goes uh, almost vertically up off to your left. And um, I would recommend four-wheel drive, but with four-wheel drive, you can definitely do it. Uh, it's maybe a mile and a half drive up to the lake. The lake is uh, maybe comparable with Horseshoe Lake, maybe a little bit larger. Uh, and that's a good spot for Canada Jays sometimes, as well as a lot of other cool uh, mountain specialties. Um, come on. Black-backed woodpecker, uh, pretty similar situation with this bird and Canada Jay. It was also pretty much only seen before at Cold Springs uh, and still pretty rarely. There was a pair that nested there a few times in recent years. Um, this is a this is an easy woodpecker to identify. It's the only woodpecker in that part in that area with an entirely black back. Um, I would actually say the best way to find these and how most of them that I found this uh, last year were found was by their drum. Uh, it's the by far the loudest drum of any woodpecker besides a pileated or pileated. Um, and uh, it's hard to describe, but it's pretty. Uh, the cadence does not change. It doesn't really speed up or get slower. It's just like a constant, really deep, uh, loud drum. And they typically search out trees that will give them the loud, mo loudest, most resounding drum. Um, these are pretty big. They're maybe right about the size of a hairy woodpecker, a little, slightly, slightly bigger. Um, a good spot for these that's just out of Butte County, there's a, the road to Sunflower Flat, which is to your right just before you get to Cold Springs. There's a big burned area out there. I had six there in one day um, in about September, I wanna say. Uh, these are anywhere between June and October. It's the best time to see these anywhere again above about 5,000 feet. Um, and then, uh, Scott's John Creek, same spot that the uh, Canada Jays are. Oh, and Scott's John Creek, 
It's a turn to your left, um, a few miles up the road above Jonesville. Uh, if anyone wants more specific directions, I can give those, but um, there's a very sharp right turn to continue up to Cold Springs. And uh, there's a very sharp left turn with a road that says dead end three miles. And so that's the road to Scott for Scott's John Creek. Uh, we had as many as four black backed woodpeckers there in, at once. Uh, so that's probably the, that's the best spot I would say for both these species. Um, Green-tailed towhee, this is a, this is a juvenile. Uh, you can see in this top left photo, just bare, you can barely make out a couple tiny little specks of its rufous cap that are coming in. Um, and obviously it's got a very nice green tail, green wings. Um, going by song uh, in the mountains, these I would say most common between about 4,500 feet and up, uh, mostly in the area above Jonesville, not very many in the uh, south part of the county. Um, they also got a nice white throat patch, which is pretty distinctive. Uh, Philbrook area is really good. Uh, Cold Springs is good. Um, so visually, they're pretty easy. Uh, there are not any other green birds in our area, uh, at least in that area. And um, these are slightly smaller than our other towhees. Maybe a, these are maybe slightly larger than a fox sparrow. And uh, song-wise, fox sparrow can be very close to a green-tailed towhee, so it can take a lot of studying over time to get used to those. Um, but anytime you hear what you think could be one or the other, definitely check it out. Um, let's see if I got any more questions here. Can all woodpeckers be identified by their drum? Pretty much yes. Uh, I would definitely say that it takes a lot of time getting used to them in the field because obviously they can be somewhat variable and listening to recordings can not, can, is not always reliable. Um, Black-backed, uh, like I said, it's got that deep kind of slow drum. Pileate, or pileated has, an, Pileated sounds like um, someone hitting a tree, a hollow tree with a hammer. Um, a flicker is actually surprisingly not as loud as you would think, but a much faster cadence. So kind of maybe a little bit less than a black-backed woodpecker, but very fast drumming. Sap suckers tap very slowly. Um, because they're you know, they're not going for drilling into something as much as they are kind of picking at an at an area. So often, if you if you hear really sort of soft, slow tapping, that's likely a sap sucker. Uh, hairy woodpecker has a sort of higher, lighter pitched drum, but very fast, and you often hear them drumming in the mountains. Uh, those are probably all the easiest ones to tell by drum. Uh, okay. And uh, mountain quail. Um, so these can be pretty hard to find, or at least to see, uh, unless you know where they uh, have young or where, where they tend to uh, raise their young. This area, Scotts John Creek, there were a number of families of mountain quail hanging out in along the creek there in kind of through the late summer. Um, and so that's that's by far the best place I know of to get good views, especially of and even of chicks. Um, oftentimes you can see them crossing the road anywhere between uh, Butte Meadows and Jonesville on the on the paved road. Um, their call is what most people find them by call. Uh, they've got a really loud uh, kind of hollow whistle sort of a call. Um, very uh, easy to hear. Um, if you go anywhere above Jonesville during the spring and summer, 
uh, and you get there early in the morning, these are oftentimes the first birds you hear. Um, of course, very different from a California quail and they almost never overlap in, um, in, in altitude. Although uh, I was able to find a couple mountain quail at the Big Chico Creek, Creek Ecological Reserve last year. Um, and a couple of times I had them calling from down on the reserve uh, from Tuscan Loop in the spring. So, um, and I've heard from uh, a few people I've known that have worked there over time have told me about uh, a few times they've seen them there. So that's uh, pretty odd, but apparently they do make it down that far rarely. Um, and I think that's my last bird. Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess I should probably see if there are any more questions. Um, or I guess open it to any more questions that anyone has. Okay, Dawn says that she also had some um, mountain quail at BCCER. Um, uh, yeah, I would, uh, dates would be very helpful for those. Uh, I believe that um, Paul Maslin, who is a longtime um, volunteer at the reserve, uh, told me that he might have seen a family there once. Are the Canada Jays the same size as our scrub Jays? Um, I would say Canada Jays are maybe similar in um, body size, but they've got a little bit shorter, stubbier tail than a scrub Jay but overall they're similar in size. Um, they've got a, similar to the other Jays, they've got a really um, kind of segmented gliding flight. And uh, they do often fly pretty high up in trees. Um, are you sharing info about your own upcoming book? Uh, I, guess I, I guess I could do that. Um, I'm currently pretty far into work on my uh, Birds of Butte County book that I've been working on since early last year. Um, sort of when the whole pandemic began, I had, <laughs> I had no real direction with what I wanted to do. I had not been birding very much in a few years. And uh, I decided to get back into it. And pretty soon after that, uh, I decided that I wanted to make a book for Butte County. Um, it's going to be a combination of a field guide and a, sort of a guide to finding birds, um, sort of to for people of all skill levels. Uh, and I'm attempting to finish that by the end of this year. Any more hot spots for birding in Butte County that you want to share? Uh, let's see, somewhere I've been going a lot lately that I don't see many people going is the Oroville Wildlife Area. Um, there's some really, really cool areas in there. A uh, spot I just discovered is called One Mile Pond. Uh, called that because it's actually a pond that's a mile long, which dis discovering lakes or ponds or bodies of water that large that you don't know about as a birder is uh, pretty awesome. So that could be a really great spot for ducks in winter. Uh, it's got a really nice, on one side you got the lake, on the other side you have the, the Feather River, um, and that's, you can access that off Larkin Road south of the After Bay. Um, and then there's a couple other units of the Oroville Wildlife Area that are also really good. Um, Other than that other in, in that other reserve in Butte Creek Canyon that you go to uh, since BFEB is technically closed. Oh, okay. So there is another reserve in Butte Creek Canyon and it is below um, BCEP, the Butte Creek Ecological Preserve. I'm relatively sure this other reserve is owned by Fish and Game. 
uh, and managed by Fish and Game. There is no vehicle access, but um, the only way you can actually access the full unit is by crossing the creek. So that's pretty difficult to do this time of year. I'll likely be doing that sometime in the next couple of weeks, just because I want to see what's there in winter, even if I have to, you know, hike up to my waist in the creek, that's no big deal. Um, but in, in late spring and summer, uh, like at the spot Oki Dam down at the bottom of Honey Run Road is a spot where you can cross easily. Uh, there's a bunch of ponds in that unit. So it could be really interesting, good for migrants, good for ducks, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, waders is a good idea. <laughs> um, let's see. So, um, uh, Le Liam, um, so are you about to wrap up here and yeah. a few more questions? Anyone, a few more questions? He He's actually given us incredible tips and, and from his incredible skill of birding tonight. And I think uh, our bird world has definitely opened up of what we have in Butte County. It's really phenomenal that uh, you're out there every day and it, and it just is such a passion. What a great thing. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, one last chance for any questions or comments. Um, some, I mean, we can unmute right now. We're just sort of, you know, we'll, we'll even talk over each other. It's kind of nice if you can give some voice to Liam. <laughs> We've all been <laughs> muted. <laughs> so, Thanks, yeah, Liam. Good job. Good evening, Thank you. everyone. <laughs> so um, it was an incredible evening. Um, I'm anxious to go out to some of these spots he's talking about, so that's why I asked him, where are some of those other hot spots? And, you know, all, a lot of us have been out there, but I think with Liam this last year, discovering even more, so we're very uh, fortunate and lucky to have Liam in Butte County. So anyway, I guess uh, we'll wrap it up for tonight. What I want to say, a couple more things, definitely stay tuned into Zoom for the next two months. We do have uh, Roger Letterer and Carol Burr talking uh, April and May. They're uh, quite the couple in the bird world. They were also a keynote speaker at Snow Goose, but both of them are authors too. So um, Liam has something to share with them uh, with books on birds. So Roger's April 19th talk will be on beaks, bones, and bird song. And uh, it reveals the strange and wondrous adaptations of birds that, that have to rely on to get by. So it's going to be quite a uh, program about birds and their everyday struggles to just uh, and challenges that they have to go through every day. And then Carol, who does all the illustrations in, in uh, their bird book, she's going to talk about a lot of um, ways that birds have depicted, been de have been depicted through the thousands of years starting on cave walls. But she's also going to give us an illustrate uh, time in her studio and show us how she does illustrate birds. So anyway, um, exciting couple of months, exciting couple of months for spring bird field trip. And uh, we want to thank Liam again. Uh, excellent program. Really very good. Thank you. Absolutely. It was very fun. I want to stay on and see the rest of the photos, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Liam. Really enjoyed your program. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Liam? Yeah. If you want to stay on, some of us were still interested. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we have more to say. I mean, maybe uh, some people need to go and some are interested. Okay. Yeah. I am. I can talk for however long, so. Oh.
And uh, Liam, did I cut you off too short? Or no, you... that was that was my last slide. So oh, okay. okay, I thought you yeah. might have more. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, if anyone else has any questions about how to get places or where to look for stuff, whatever, I can totally answer any questions like that. Well, I know this summer I want you to have field trips up in those high uh, Butte County elevations. Definitely, I, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm totally Lake. looking forward to that. Yeah, Summit Lake and Cold Spring, which I've mm -hmm. been up there. That's incredible up there. I'm not and sure that, if it burned or not. Did it burn? Uh, no, it did not. Um, there's hardly anywhere that burned in that section of the county. Um, there's a little bit. There's a little bit that burned between the kind of the Cold Springs area and Philbrook, but it's it's very minimal within Butte County. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about leading a trip either to Strawberry Valley campground area or oh, yeah. uh, Little Grass Valley reservoir That would be awesome. Uh, I was just up in that area and there is way too much snow for what it okay. usually is. So it could be a while. Same with, um, I, I'm eagerly looking forward to checking out Snag Lake some because it doesn't have water for that much of the year and ducks are not really going to be there for very long. So unfortunately, there's a whole lot of snow. So <laughs> tomorrow's the first day that the gate might open. So I may try to go check that out tomorrow, but we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think if I do the um, Strawberry Valley, I can probably do a trip to Spotted Owl. Oh, yeah, that'd um, be awesome. Yeah. If I get to do Little Grass Valley Reservoir, which will be later in the season, of course, and after the snow melts, <laughs> right? I might be able to do Spotted Owl and Goshawk. Well, perfect. Well, maybe by then we can have a dozen or more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be yeah. good. <laughs> well, you know, Mary, what you should do is uh, please try to find a Goshawk in Butte County because <laughs> it's it's crazy difficult for some reason. Mary could do it. I agree with that. <laughs> Mary is like inspired me to identify uh, these raptors much farther away than I thought I could. She I, is amazing. I would think they'd be up at Colby Meadows. Yeah, well, there have been there have been good spots in past years. Um, you know, like uh, yeah, Colby Meadows. Um, that Butte Creek House Meadow has been a good spot in the past. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, I spent about um, between May and September, I probably spent about 80 days up there looking for goshawks as one of my targets, and I could never find one. So uh, I guess it's just, you just got to be lucky sometimes. I think I have a place, I think it might be in Plumas, I'm not sure, not far from... Uh, Sly Creek Reservoir, but I'll have to check on the okay. county line. And there's there's that spot you were, uh, the spot you've told me about um, near where that spotted owl spot is too. But yeah, I think you said that was a few years ago, right? Yeah. Okay. What about the, um, was it Sunflower Flats? Oh, uh-huh. Um, that's a good hike in, isn't it? Yeah. A good bird. That is a good spot. That would be good too. Oh yeah, some when we were when Charlie and I were on that trail looking for the gray jays, I mean mm -hmm. the Canada jays. <laughs> yeah. Some hikers came through and they told us that this gray bird was dive bombing them on that trail. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think I think we're getting all excited about summer. <laughs> I know. <laughs> when you get up to uh. the mountains. Yeah. I'm just, I'm looking forward to uh, April when all the shorebirds start showing up. I'm, I'll, I'll probably be at, you know, if anyone wants to join, I'll probably be at Yano Seiko for some part of every day of April, so. April, okay. You know that, that new wetland area off of the Oro Chico? That's a really good spot, Mary. <laughs> I'm amazed yeah. I didn't know about that. I, I heard the guy, when I was leading the Snow Goose Festival trip last year, we went to that wood, yeah. wood place as part of uh -huh. our field trip. Oh, and wow. he was talking about creating that wetland. 
it's I'm I'm curious how long they'll keep water in it because it looks like with how much water is in it now, it looks like it could easily have water through spring or at least the beginning of spring. Unfortunately, I, mean, I, like I think the the best pond for shorebirds is kind of behind the first yeah, one. Yeah, it's a little bit farther back. Luckily, yeah. though, there is, I did find there is a spot you can pull off farther up that little hill where you mm -hmm. can scope out over the close pond. No, but that big that big pond is really good right now. Okay, any more questions? Well, somebody asked them a question about, are you still in school? What's oh, uh, am I still in school? Uh, not in school. Uh, really, okay. birds are about 99% of my focus. Um, I'm, I eventually, I want to be able to sort of use all this information I'm gathering to, you know, influence conservation or those kind of things. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, you don't know what sort of habitat to protect or what, you know, what areas are important unless you really um, figure out what species are there, when they're there, you know, what their populations are like, things like that. So cool. ultimately the, uh, the birds are my main concern. So until I, until I can't do that anymore, that's probably what I'll be doing every day. Hopefully make a career out of it eventually. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, your parents are putting up pictures of when you were young. <laughs> <laughs> and I, oh, I remember that, that trip. That was great. Oh, wow. The Ruby Mountains. I think that's the one. Is that the Ruby Mountains? Could be. All right. Um, Okay, is everybody ready to, to go? I'll end the meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Bye, everybody.